We have a special Midwest mix style number we want to share with you, so you can go ahead and stay seated. Um, this is just a little taste of what's going to be happening in the North Auditorium starting September 7th. So you'll want to check it out, and we hope this encourages your soul. We've got this hope. We've got a future. We've got the power of the resurrection living within. We've got this hope. We've got a promise that we are held up and protected in the palm of his hand. And even when our hearts are breaking, even when our souls are shaking, oh, oh, oh we've got this hope. Oh, 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 oh. Even when the tears are falling, even when the night is calling, oh, 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 oh we've got this hope. Oh, 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 oh. And we're not alone. Our God is with us. We can approach His throne with confidence, cause He made a way when trouble our fortress. We know that those who place their hope in Him will not be ashamed. And even when our hearts are breaking, even when our souls are shaking, oh, oh, oh we've got this hope. Oh, 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 oh. Even when the tears are falling, even when the night is calling, Awesome, right? Just to know that we're never hopeless through Jesus Christ. What an encouraging message this morning. I don't know about you, but I'm super excited about Midwest Mix that's going to be starting, as Jacqueline mentioned, it's going to be starting September 8th in the North Auditorium. So you'll be sure to want to check that out. Thank you so much, Jacqueline and Austin, for sharing that great song with us. So before we continue in our service, I just want to share with you something really exciting um, that happened here at New Spring on Friday night. So we held our Kids World um, family experience, and we just really love our families here at New Spring. So we were excited to see parents with their young kids having fun, celebrating God. But more importantly, we saw 16 kids go public with their faith through baptism. That is amazing, right? Absolutely, definitely something worth celebrating. And we want to share just a snippet of what happened on Friday night. Check out this short video. Kids and families had a great time this Friday night at Kids World's Back to School FX. The kids took over the South Auditorium to learn with their parents all about the big idea of obedience. Families enjoyed seeing the entire Bible brought to life as we talked about God's big story. This school year, 252 Theater will be going through the Bible from start to finish to help kids understand how God has invited them to be a part of His big story. The most exciting part of the night was when 16 Kids World kids started their next chapter in that story by going public with their faith through Watermark. We're excited for these 16 kids as they start this next part of their spiritual journey. I want to get back because um, I, I want to show everyone that I believe in God. I'm getting baptized today 
because I want everyone to know that I love Jesus Christ and that he is the, my best friend. That is amazing. We are just celebrating that today. Well, we are so excited that you guys are here with us. Um, we invite you to stand to your feet as we begin singing out some amazing songs to our amazing Father. Our Father who has many names. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He is a light unto our feet in a dark place. And we are just celebrating that in this new song. So we invite you to sing this out with us. Just 
want those words to just speak over you for a minute. If we can just think about that, because of who we, He is, who our God is, we are never defeated. For we serve a way-making, miracle-working God who is in our midst and working even right here and right now. For the Bible says that where two or more are gathered in His name, He is there as well. And I believe that He is working right now. And what's amazing to know is that if you're here with us this morning, if you are living and breathing, God is not done with you yet. He is not done with you yet. For He knows the plans that He has for you. And we're celebrating that because He is a way maker. So we're gonna sing this chorus one more time. And we invite you to proclaim that out. If you believe that God is not done with you, let's sing this out together. with the 
So much bigger than we thought. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us. Actually, you can stay standing for just a moment. And where's Mark? Where's Mark at? Mark, you're over there. He doesn't know I'm going to do this. But today is Mark's birthday. So birthday boy, come on out here. Come on out here for just one second. Carla, give me a good people singing key. There we go. I know Facebook Live's probably gonna shut us down for about five seconds for copyright infringement on happy birthday, but how many opportunities do you get, you know, you know, 1,500 people in here, those of you in the North Auditorium watching online, everybody, probably about 7,000 people to get to sing you happy birthday. <laughs> and not just to anybody, but to someone who brings God's truth every single week into your life, right when you need it. So we're gonna sing happy birthday, but while we're singing, I also just want you to pray a special prayer to God, a blessing on the ministry of this man's life as he's gonna be traveling uh, today and this week and, and, and taking God's word all over this world uh, and the lives that he's able to touch um, through the gift that God has given him that we are thankful for. So would you join me in singing happy birthday to our pastor, Mark. Happy birthday.
This series is all about answering the question, why would I be better off if I follow Jesus? This probably isn't something that you would hear a lot about at New Spring because God has blessed us so much and continues to bring people in our doors all the time. But culturally, here in the United States, especially in regard to evangelical churches, there's a deep concern because through the years, people have been polled as to their beliefs. And if they are people of faith, Christian faith, they're asked to declare what their faith is. And so it could be Protestant, Catholic, it could be Pentecostal, Charismatic, Evangelical, Baptist, so on and so forth. And what we're seeing today in our culture that's causing a lot of concern, especially among evangelicals, is a particular response to that question. And that question that garners that response is, what faith do you have? And the answer, none, is a growing segment of the population. In fact, in the world where I live, as a church leader, there's a lot of discussion about the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, those who have no faith. And I am thankful here at New Spring that that's not something that's going on inside our walls, but I'm cognizant of the fact, for various reasons, and some of them I'll touch on tonight, that there is a moving away from faith in our country. Now, part of that could be prophetic in nature, because the Bible indicates that before Jesus comes back, there would be, this is how the King James characterizes it, a great falling away or a great apostasy. So arguably, it could be a prophetic sign. For me, I can't afford to go there because I believe that the reason why there are many who say they have no belief in God or no belief in a defined faith is because it's been so poorly defined by the family of faith, especially here in the United States. It's been wrongly defined in many cases. So if I were young, growing up, getting the Daffy information that's all over the internet, and I didn't have someone making the case in a cogent, plausible, systematic way, I too might say I, I am a nun. Now I'm not because I am fortunate in that I understand what the Christian life is all about. But as leader here at New Spring, I, I want to answer the question, what would I get from following Jesus that I wouldn't get otherwise? Because if there's not a good answer to that question, then I would have to be the first in line to say there's no particular reason for you to follow Jesus, for you to commit your life to him, to make a public profession, to follow him in believer's baptism, to be in church, to learn about the Christian life, to read your Bible, pray, worship every day of your life. If there's no takeaway, well, then I understand why people are nuns. But there, there are huge takeaways, and that's why I'm bringing you this series. My goal is to give a defense without being defensive. Because I know that if, even if I look out at this audience at 4 o'clock on Saturday night, we're a diverse bunch. Some of you have been Christ followers for decades. Others of you, you've been Christ follower for days or weeks. And some of you don't know for sure what you believe, or you may be... You may be one of the nuns and you're here because your wife is a believer, your husband's a believer, your parents are a believer, you, you want a good experience for your kids. And even if someone asked you, are you a Christ follower, you might say yes, but deep inside it isn't something that really gets into the groundwater of your life. So that's what this series is about. And I have to tell you that tonight's talk is well, I, it's going to be hard because I'm probably going to say every one of these talks is my favorite. And so I, I know I have a bad habit of doing that, but I just don't know that there's anything I love more than this one tonight. One person I have a lot of affection and respect for is a guy who was a pastor for many years, but then because he was so successful talking to the corporate world, in time, he began to do that as a ministry and a mission. And his ministry, his vocation has taken him to the boardrooms and conference halls of so many of the businesses here in the United States, including the military. His name is John Maxwell. And John Maxwell's written many books. Uh, John wrote a book called The 21 Laws of Leadership, and that's a very popular book. One of the things that John says 
And, and, and I like it, although I'm, I'm going to push against it for a minute. John says leaders see more and they see before. And there are others who take that concept and they'll express it a different way. My personal favorite is leaders see around corners. And as a leader, I try to do that in the corporate sense in which it's presented there. But the truth is, the actual factual truth is that leaders don't see any more than anybody else sees. And they can't see before because leaders are relegated to seeing the same stuff everybody else is seeing and they can't see the future. No one can see the future. So what are we talking about? What's John talking? And by the way, if John were standing right here, John would tell you, hey, Mark's right on what he's about to say. What are we talking about when we say leaders see more we see before? Well, it means analysis and projection. They, they analyze well, they project well, or we might say they connect the dots. Really, if you want a scientific term for what John's talking about, it would be hypothesis. Hypothesis is a big four-syllable word, which means literally educated guess. So when leaders see more, leaders see before, what they are doing is they are guessing. But if you are a Christ follower, you can legitimately say, I see more, I see before. So if someone came to me tonight, especially given my topic, and they said, Mark, why are you a Christ follower? After all, you were taught evolution from the second grade in Texas all the way through the 12th grade in public schools. You've seen what the evolutionists have to say. You've seen what the naturalists say. You've read it. You've debated it. You've interacted with non-theists all these years. You're well cognizant of what those teach who do not believe in God. Why are you a Christ follower? Well, last week, we talked about how we can become a new person. Well, that's a good reason, but I can honestly say one reason why I follow Jesus is I see more, and I see before. Let's talk about that. How is that possible? Well, before we get to that answer, I want to take you to the scripture that we're pulling this from. Remember, if you were here last week, all of our seven messages are going to come from four chapters, sequential chapters in the book of 2 Corinthians. Hope you read these. 2 Corinthians 3, 4, 5, 6. Out of those four chapters are going to come these seven declarations, these seven triumphant declarations, because Paul has said, this is the new way. The old way with the law and the punishment brought death, but this is the new way, the new way we live in Jesus Christ. So in these four chapters, while he's explaining the new way, in one of the shortest verses of this text, which is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, and a spoiler alert, when I get to talking about eternal life in a couple of weeks, just act like you haven't heard me say this already. Verse 7 is a parenthetical expression. That occurs between, of course, verse 6 and verse 8. You probably know at least one of those verses. Verse 6 says, as long as we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. Bet you've already guessed verse 8, especially if you grew up in church. Because verse 8 says, when we die, we are absent from the body and present with the Lord. So, in between verse 6 and verse 8 is this wonderful little parenthesis that just simply says, we live by faith and not by sight. We live by faith and not by sight. Well, back in the years when I was doing debate, and if you've ever done debate in high school or college, you know that the first thing you do if you're a first affirmative speaker is you have to define terms because you can't have a debate if you haven't settled the definition of terms. So the old debater in me is going to come out, and let's just say before I get started here, when we take that expression, we live by faith and not by sight, we need to know what faith is and we need to know what sight is. <clears throat> well, sight here, of course, is much more than just the ability to see physically. What the Bible is talking about here is reality limited to, dictated by, and defined by sensory perception. In other words, it is what you're able to appreciate, identify, and apply with your senses, that is sight. Now, when the Bible says we live by faith and not by sight, I want you to understand something, especially if you're not a Christ follower and you're not a theist. 
The Bible here is not denying sight. It's not saying that sensory perception does not exist. Notice that the Bible does not say we live by faith and deny what we can perceive. It just says we don't live by it. In fact, I would make the argument that when the Bible puts it in those terms, it is God's way of identifying and valuing sensory perception. It just simply says that when those two are compared and contrasted, we live by faith and not by sight. So faith here does not deny the truth of sight. Here's the big thing. It takes us beyond It takes us beyond what we can perceive, what we can see, what we can hear, what we can touch, even what what we can sense on a material level. Now, this is where you're going to have to be willing to broaden your perspective because, frankly, faith is so wrongly defined. When When I talk to my friends who are not Christ followers or not theists, and I hear I hear them define faith. I'm very well aware of the fact they don't know how to define faith. It, it says, do you know what a straw man is? Do you know what a straw man argument is? Or, or paper tiger? It, it, it's as if someone has created a caricature of the truth, and then they push back against that caricature, and of course, finding flaws in it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So when I hear my friends who are not believers speak of faith, it, they don't understand it. And, and Lord knows, I don't blame them because most of what they know is a corruption that has been generated by so-called Christ followers, televangelists on television. And, and that's why the world makes such fun of faith because they don't have, they don't have a real definition of faith. And there's a reason for that. Just so that you will understand, that is not an accident. It isn't something that just happens for no reason at all. The reason why faith is so wrongly defined is found for us in 1 John 5, verse 4, because the Bible says, everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So when the Bible tells us this is how we overcome, you can be sure that if Satan is going to attack the definition of anything, he would attack the definition of the one thing that God says, this is how we're going to overcome the world. Faith. And by the way, let me point out, we have never been commanded to overcome the world with military might. Horrible things have happened in the name of Jesus Christ by those who committed identity theft, stole his name, and did horrific things. Never have we been told to overcome the world with military might. Never have we been commanded to overcome the world with political might. The Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, the faith that we have in God that's attractive, that causes people to want to follow Jesus Christ. May God help us in the church in the 21st century to recover that. Now, what are some wrong definitions of faith? Here's the first one. Faith oftentimes, and I I hate to admit this, but you caught me a few minutes ago. I actually misspoke. And, And Maybe it was a Freudian kind of thing or something, but I misspoke a few moments ago, and I'm guilty of this. Faith is often used as a synonym for religion. So consequently, in this context, someone might say, what faith are you? Or what is your faith? And, and we know how to answer that question. You know, a person might say, well, I'm Catholic. Or a person might say, I'm Buddhist. Or a person might say, I'm a born-again Christian. And that would be how it would be used in the culture. Another way that that would be used is uh, we're familiar with the term faith-based organization. (laughs) We all know that means religion. When when someone says, what faith are you, that means what religion are you. When someone says it's a faith-based organization, it means it's a religion-based organization. So that's one false definition. Another false definition is faith is often used to categorize the metaphysical or the unexplainable. So consequently, and this is how a lot of my friends um, who don't believe, and they 
they like me, and so they try to find some sort of kind way to express the fact that they think I believe something that's wrong, is they will say, okay, I'm a person of science. I'm purely materialist. You know, I look at things from a materialistic universe, naturalist, naturalistic universe, and you are a person of faith. And they're not ripping me. They're just saying, Maybe there is a metaphysical. We don't know. We can't see it. We can't put it on a slide under a microscope or see it in a telescope. Maybe there is the metaphysical. Maybe there is the unexplainable, you know, that twilight zone kind of stuff. And that is how they see faith. And then there are those, especially in the mental health community, who believe that faith is regarded as an emotional or psychological benefit, even if it has no basis in truth. And I've seen textbooks that were atheistic in nature, but they would say faith may be a good thing. If a person has faith, maybe it will help them get over illnesses faster. It is basically positive thinking and its benefits that it would have on the body. Well, you bag it all up and it all adds up to one thing, a cultural definition of faith which would be wanting something to be so uh, wanting something to be true so bad that you actually begin to believe it's true. And frankly, out there in the world, that's what they hear. If I were to say, I live by faith and not by sight, they would say, yes, that is your problem. That is what's wrong with you. That is what's wrong with church. That's what's wrong with everybody who is religious. You want to believe something is true so bad that you actually begin to believe it's true. We see it outside the church. I mean, because in our world today, and this is, uh, I don't want to get on a horse here, but most public voices today review or, or view what we believe somewhere along the lines of the tooth fairy and the unicorns. And my non-theist friends have a slur for God that they use as they whistle through the graveyard. They call him the flying spaghetti monster. Uh, but that's, that's the idea. And they look at us and say, you, you, what you believe is not true. You want it to be true. You don't want to believe that when you die, you go to the ground. And so consequently, you want to believe in an afterlife. So you want to believe it's so bad, you believe it true. You believe it's true. That's faith. You, you don't want to feel alone in the world, and you want to believe that there's this cosmic helper in the sky. You want to believe it's so bad that you believe it's true. That's faith. Now, that's one thing, but what's especially troubling is, especially in the last 75 years in the United States, there's been a lot of that inside the church. We've had a distorted form of Christianity that some call prosperity theology or the prosperity gospel, or name it and claim it. The idea is if you want something to be true, then you just believe it. You just declare it. And consequently, you have faith that it is true. And that's gone to all kinds of extremes. In fact, there was actually one group in the United States in the late 19th century that took it to bizarre extremes and basically said things like illness and, you know, problems are not really real. You just think they're real. If you're sick, you just think you're sick. You're not really sick, you know. You just think you are. And it was bizarre, but it attracted a huge number of Americans. The story is told of a skeptic who was walking down the, you know, or, uh, or uh, one of the members of this particular group that was walking down the street, and he, accom- he found a little boy and knew the little boy's great-grandmother was, was sick. And so he asked the little boy, he said, how's your great-grandmother? And he said, oh, my grand- great-grandmother's sick. And the guy said, oh, you can't say that she's sick. She just thinks she's sick. So the next day, he saw him and said, how's your great-grandmother? He said, well, she thinks she's dead now, you know. (laughs) None of that is what faith is. And could I just say one more time to any of us who are Christ followers here at New Spring, if we bought into the idea that somehow you can declare something to be true, and that is faith, That is not faith at all. Let me give you two verses that give us an understanding of faith. 
One of the verses that I love so much is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, because it tells us how important faith is. It says, it is impossible to please God without faith. Now think about that for a moment. It is impossible to please God without faith. Do you really think that God is saying, you cannot please me unless you want something to be true so bad that you actually begin to believe it's true? Well, that wouldn't even fit the history that we have in the Bible. If you want to see the purest definition of faith, for me, it is Romans chapter 10, verse 17. And it goes like this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. By the way, if you're a Christ follower and you want your faith to grow, you just got the the game plan right there. You hear the word of God, you believe it, and faith grows in your life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, take a deep breath because this is so important. There is always a prime requisite for faith, and that is God's word. For faith to exist, you must have God's word. Now, here's the thing. Let's say I get sick. I don't want to get sick, but sooner or later I will. Now, I can say I believe by faith that I'm going to be healed. Now, I cannot claim by faith that I am going to be healed. I mean, the fact of the matter is, sooner or later, we're going to all die. And this has caused all kinds of problems in the church because sometimes people have claimed by faith that they're going to be healed and they don't get well. And then someone will say, well, you just didn't have enough faith. And that's, that's demonic. I mean, that's way past wrong. That's demonic. But we'll set that aside for just a moment. But I'll tell you what I can have faith in. I can have faith that God heals, that God is powerful enough to heal me, and that if it's his will, he can heal me. And I can pray in faith because, see, I have God's word on those things. I know that God does heal, and he does heal sometimes. Have I seen miracles? Absolutely, I've seen miracles. I've been on, I've, listen, I could keep you here for the rest of the night telling you stories of the last 35 years nearly of my pastor at here where I've prayed for people, and I've seen God heal them on the spot. So if, if anyone thinks I don't believe God heals, you're so wrong. I believe we can have faith in what the Bible tells us for sure, but I can't have faith that just because I want something to be true so badly that I believe it. Now, here's how it works. Here's the construct. How can I say we see more, we see before? Start with this. God sees more and God sees before. Would you agree with that if you're a God follower tonight? God sees more and God sees before. Number two, I trust God. When God tells me what more there is, and when he, t- when he tells me the future, and I trust what he tells me, then I begin to see more, and I begin to see before. Do you understand that? I'm saying when God tells me something, and I trust God, suddenly I can see what God sees that he tells me about. I, I can see the bigger picture. I can see the future which was what excited me in the Clash of Dynasties series because I have the opportunity to look at our world today and tell you what I do know is going to happen. Now let's go back to our verse. The Bible says we live by faith and not by sight. Now one more time for skeptics, it doesn't mean that we discount physical evidence because it's God who gave us the abilities to process physical evidence. It's not that we deny science. It just means, and this is so important, the picture is bigger than we can see. Can we just say, there's more going on. I mean, how many of us are down tonight because we, we're going by what we can see, and what we can see doesn't look good, but there's more going on than we can see. There's more happening. The picture is bigger than we can see this evening. And... Only the future can put today's stories into perspective. That's why faith is so important. And so what the Bible is saying is since the picture is so much bigger than we can see and only the future can put things into perspective, God says that's why we live by faith because it's the only way to live. Why would we live only seeing part of the picture? Why would we live taking the future out of play? Faith in God's word gives us information that's better and more complete and trustworthy compared to the information that we get by sensory perception. When I thought about bringing this talk to you, and I've been working on it for weeks because I couldn't wait till this one, 
I hope that you'll get a new definition or a new picture of faith in your mind. Do, do you know what it means, at least to some extent, do you know what it means for a pilot to fly on instruments? You mean because there are pilots who are visual rated and there are pilots who are instrument rated. Pilots who are not instrument rated should not fly through storms. Now these are pilots who can see very well. They have to pass eye test, eye test, continual eye test in order to be able to fly. They have windows in their airplane. They can see just fine, but they should not fly in bad weather unless they are instrument rated. I've learned more about this from one of our, one of our members here at New Spring. Ironically, well, he is a top doctor, and of all things, he is a retina surgeon. So he knows more about sight than anybody else I know. But he's only, not only a, a, one of the greatest doctors in our country and one of the greatest surgeons in our country, he's also a great pilot. He's a flight instructor. And so many times Joe has told me about the importance of being instrument rated. In other words, not to trust the senses because sometimes the visual perspective is not available and beyond that the senses can lie to us and so at that moment the pilot even though he may feel disoriented his answer is to trust the instruments trust the information that's coming to him it's more important than sight because it is trustworthy it is information that will allow him to land the plane safely. It is the information that will allow him to stay on course or allow her to stay on course until she can land the plane safely. So do, can we just, can, 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 that idea of believing that faith is just wanting something to be true so bad that we believe, can we take it back to the store and turn it back in and get a refund? And can we walk out with faith is like flying on instruments? Because when I have God's word, even though my perception is all whacked, and I may think up is down and down is up and left is right and right is left, and I may feel that way, but when I have God's word, suddenly I can fly on instruments. I can see more than what's going on. I can see before it happens because God has told me that is what it means to have faith. When you trust God's word on something, you see more. It's not that what's there is not true, not true necessarily. It's just that you see more. Now, just in case this seems a little theoretical, I want you to perform a mental exercise with me. Okay? Work with me for a second. How many of us, maybe you'll get a situation in your head, how many of us would have done something very different than we did if we could have seen the whole picture? Fair? It's like, um, would not have had my first divorce. <laughs> no, no. How many of us, if you, if you could have seen the whole picture, you wouldn't have bought that car. You wouldn't have taken that job. If you could have seen the whole picture, you wouldn't have reacted that way. How, how, many, how many husbands were the worst? Here's the deal. We, we get into like an uh, argument with our wives, and then, you know, we're just so sure we're right. And then she brings up a few things. Guys, well, I didn't know that. Well, I, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know. I, 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 you know, that's how we get into that. Because we didn't know the whole picture, see. So, and that's the first question I want to ask you. How many of us can think of situations we would, have, we would have done something very different if we could see the whole picture. Now, let me ask you this. How many of us would have done something very different if we could have seen the future? Well, we, did, we would not have taken underwater basket weaving in college. We'd have gotten engineering courses. <laughs> yeah, man, if I had seen student debt, I would have worked harder on that scholarship when I was in high school. You see what I'm saying? If we could see more, if we could see before, it would have a bearing on what we do. Now let's go a step further because now we're about to get to ground zero of faith. What if you couldn't see the whole picture? What if you couldn't see the future, but you could get a reassurance from a trustworthy person who had? 
You, you can't see everything, but someone you know tells the truth has seen everything, and that person gives you a reassurance. Or that person has seen the future, and you haven't seen it. Now, let me ask you this. Okay, work with me, please. How do people, what is it that people like that say? I can't tell you right now, but trust me. I, I can't explain it all right now. You're just going to have to trust me on this. I mean, I've, I've had this happen sometimes because, you know, I've had people through the years that sell clothes to me at a store. And I'd see something on the shelf, and I'm about to pick it up and buy it. And the guy who sells clothes to me knows me, says, I can't tell you right now. Come back on Saturday. <laughs> I can't. I, and, and, and I'm not going to ask him, is there a sale? I'm not going to ask him what the discount is. He'd get fired. He's just like saying, I can't tell you right now, but just trust me. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just gotten to ground zero of what faith is. The God who sees more and the God who has seen the future says to me, Mark, I can't explain it all to you right now. Right now, your heart is breaking. And right now, you don't understand why these things are happening like they're happening. And you don't know why this has come up. But trust me. Trust me on this. Trust me. I, 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 know, I know, Mark, I know this is, so too, this is too big for you. If I explained it, it would be like putting a jet engine in a Volkswagen. I can't explain it to you. Just trust me on this. There is more going on than you can see right now. Do you know that? So many of us are at the breaking point, aren't we? We feel like we've just had about all we can take. And it looks like it isn't going to change. And it's not going to get any better. There is more going on, though. I've told you this story so many times from the Bible. I hope you never get tired of it, though. Back in the Old Testament, there was a prophet named Elisha. And he had been helping the king of Israel defeat the more powerful Syrian army. And the king of Syria couldn't understand why the king of Israel seemed to know wherever it was they were going to attack. And one of his generals said, it's because there's a preacher down there. And somehow that preacher knows where he sees more and sees before. He tells the king where we're going to attack. And the king of Syria said, well, there's no sense in letting one preacher get in our way. Let's just take the army down there and kill that preacher. And so one morning, the preacher and his assistant look out the window, and their subdivision is surrounded by the Syrian army. Chariots, horses, tanks, fighter jets. Well, no, not that. <laughs> I mean, it is overkill to the max. And the assistant is freaking out because all he can see is the Syrian army come to kill him. Listen to what Elisha said. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him. For there are more on our side. Let me read it with different inflection. There are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. There was an angel army. We sing a song about that. There was an angel army surrounding the, the, the Syrian army. See, the thing of it was, it wasn't that the Syrian army wasn't there. It's not that sight is, is we're, not, we're not told faith is not denial. It's just there's more going on than we can see. Some of you tonight, you look at your circumstances and you think, my kids are never going to get it right, or your marriage is never going to be right, or, or, or I'm, and the main thing is you're wondering if you're going to be able to survive it, and you're just wondering, am I going to be able to put one foot in front of the other for another day? I just want to tell you, I don't know for sure what's going to happen with your kids. I don't know for sure what's going to happen with your marriage. I just do know this. I know there's more going on than you can see. That I know.
Let me give you another proof. When Jesus was on the earth, there was one thing he always commended and one thing he always complained about. It is interesting that uh, the, probably I'm sure there were people who sang songs and preached sermons and taught lessons and, you know, fixed dinners and stuff. I don't think I ever see any place in the Bible where Jesus said, boy, that's a nice sermon or that's a good song. That was a really pretty song or that. The one thing he always commended was faith, wasn't it? If he found faith, he was happy. If he didn't find faith, he wasn't happy. So consequently, it's got to be pretty important. Now, here's the thing. We're working on this concept that there's more going on than we can see. I want to take you to a situation where Jesus found faith and a spot where he didn't find faith. Now, let's, let's go to the latter first. The disciples are out in the, on the boat, and the storm comes up on Galilee, which is just a big lake. And so Peter has decided that he's going to walk to Jesus because Jesus is walking on the water, and he walks on the water a little bit. But look at this. When he saw the strong wind, now there's sight for you. When he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith. Why did you doubt me? Now, Jesus didn't say, Peter, those waves are not really waves, you know. Great grandma just thinks she's sick. He he didn't say, the wind's not really the wind. He, He was getting after Peter because Peter didn't see Jesus. He didn't see there was more going on. Now, let's look at a scenario that's a positive, okay? Now, the Bible tells us a story about a woman. She was not even Jewish, um, and she had a hemorrhage. She was bleeding internally and dying, and she'd had it for 12 years and spent every penny on doctors, and she just got continually worse. She sees Jesus coming in a crowd. Somehow she manages to slither her way through the crowd. And when she sees Jesus, she reaches down and touches the bottom of his robe. And Jesus said, who touched me? The disciples are always trying to educate Jesus. You ever notice that? That's pretty, pretty, pretty silly, isn't it? The disciples said, what do you mean who touched you? There's hundreds of people touching you. Jesus said, no, somebody touched me differently. Who touched me? And he called the woman forward. And when, she, of course, she was terrified. She thought she was in trouble. And when Jesus saw her, he commended her faith. Why? Well, if I ask you as a Christ follower today, what is the last chapter of your Bible? You would say, I hope, Revelation 22. Hope you know where it is. That's right before the maps. The maps are not a Bible book. (laughs) The last chapter of your Bible is Revelation 22. And I mean, boy, you go right to the end of that and Jesus says he's coming back. So that's the end of our Bible. She didn't have the New Testament. Help me, Bible students, what was the last book of her Bible? Malachi. Malachi is the end of her Bible. The last chapter she has in her Bible is Malachi 4. Well, what does Malachi 4 say in verse 2? The last chapter of her Bible said, But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Wings doesn't mean wings like this. It means the fringes of your robe. The last chapter of her Bible said to those of you who fear God someday, the Son, capital S, the Son of Righteousness will arise, and he'll have so much healing in him that you can, just in the fringes of his robe there will be healing. And she slithered through that crowd and acted on the word of God that she had. See, everybody else in that crowd couldn't see that, but she saw more. The word of God told her there was more. Now, here's the thing. When the scriptures say we live by faith and not by sight, what it means is we make our choices, we make our decisions, we craft our experiences based on the superior knowledge of God's word. It doesn't mean what we see isn't true. It just means we know this is superior. There's more going on than what we can see. Now, 
I'm out of time. It's five o'clock right now. So I know I've got to bring this in for a landing. Some of you are Bible students. And if I asked you, where would I find the Hall of Fame of Faith? You would tell me, Mark, you'll find that in that book called Hebrews in the New Testament. And in Hebrews chapter 11, it's like walking through a hall of fame. Because the Bible is going to talk about all the men and women who are heroes of following God. Now, so many times, 20 times plus, it's going to say, by faith, this person did something. So with 501, I'm only going to give you two. But my point is this. When you live by faith, what you believe makes you do certain things. I want to read you two examples. Here's verse 8. By faith... Abraham, when called to go out to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he didn't know where he was going. Don't you know people thought he was crazy? Abraham, I see you got got the U-Haul truck out there. So, buddy, you guys moving? Where are you going? Well, I don't know. (laughs) Excuse me. You got everything loaded up? I mean, I see Sarah wrapping her dishes over there and putting them. You don't know where you're going? No, don't know where I'm going. But God had told him, see. And so consequently, he just by faith went, even though he didn't know where he's going. Now, if I don't read you the next verse, you're going to say, that still sounds crazy to me. But listen to this. Listen to his rationale. For he was looking forward. It wasn't just that he saw more based on what faith told him. He was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So he said, you know what? I'm not worried about where I'm going next. I'm going ultimately to heaven, so I'm just going to walk with God. Okay, let me give you the next one. Hebrews 11, because here's the thing, by faith, you're not going to be able to participate in a lot of stuff that a lot of people around you are participating in. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward by faith. He, pers- I love this, by faith he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Awesome. They saw more. They saw before. May I have two more minutes, please? This is such an important message. How does it change your world if you see more and if you see before? I love, I love Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 answers both questions. How does it make our world better if we see more? Romans eight twenty eight, and we know that in all things, God works for good. What I see right now may not be good, but I know the picture is bigger. Then how does it change me if I see the future by faith? Romans eight thirty five says, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. And it goes on to say, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The life of faith gives me peace. Because it says, no matter what I can see, there's more going on than I can see, and God is working all things for my good. And it gives me peace because the future tells me nothing can ever separate me from God's love. I see more. I see before. And isn't it interesting? It is even by faith that we are saved. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. It's by grace that you've been saved through faith. Do you know why many people will never take God's... Oh, please give me another minute. Do you know why many people will never take God up on his offer? Because of what they see. How can God forgive me? How can God wash all my sins away? How can can just simply asking, how can asking a God I can't see, how can that be such that I would never have to fear for what happens when I die? Do you understand that faith says God loves me in spite? God forgives me even though Jesus paid it all amazingly. 
and by faith, I step in. By faith, I step in. If you're not sure that you've ever had that moment by faith of stepping in, then let's do it right now. I'm going to pray a prayer that just reaches out to God. If you want to join me, you can pray it silently. Ready? Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. But I believe you died for me. The Bible says you did. I believe you arose from the grave. The Bible says you did. I believe. And by faith, I step in. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Help me to live for you in Jesus' name. Any of our info centers has a gift box for you if you just prayed. All you got to say is, I pray with Mark. That's all that's required. They'll give you that gift box. Thanks for being here tonight. God bless. See you next weekend.